John Fedger here with mobilehomeinvesting.net. It may sound a little bit more echoey than usual. I'm sitting in one of my empty mobile homes right now, and I want to bring you part two of the unanswered questions from uh, just email and also other comments that have that have uh, that people have commented over the last few months uh, or longer uh, that I have not found. They've slipped through the cracks. These questions are good questions, and I want to make sure to answer these questions for folks. Um, the first one is buying uh, under the age of 55, and this is from uh, Alana Weaver, uh, and she asks, uh, when you're buying a mobile home in a senior mobile home community in an age restricted park. Are you able to do that under the age of 55? That's a popular question, and that's sort of a common sense question for those of us under the age of 55, or 40, or 45, or 50. Some parks have different requirements. Now, in some of those parks, they have like an 80, 20, or 90, 10 percentage, where 20% of the people can be under uh, the, the, the required age, or 10% can be under that required age, but there can't be any kids usually. So there's always like no minors, but, Regardless, you know, the, the, the question is, if you're 50, if you're not 55, can you purchase in a 55 plus park? And what I've seen, my experience across the country, it varies state to state within maybe 10% or so, but around the country, it's like a 50-50 percentage. If you know how to present yourself, if you know how to come across ethically and humbly and sincerely, uh, and you know what to say, you know what your goals are, you wanna work with the park, you wanna be an asset to the community, most parks, oh, I'm sorry, 50 50% of parks, not most, about half, give or take in your in your specific area, but roughly 50% of parks will not want to work with you. They'll understand what you want. We understand what you're doing. We can actually use you, but because you're not the right age, we just can't talk to you. So 50% of parks won't want to work with you. The other 50% of parks, they're going to say, don't you move in. You're not allowed to move in anything. We still got to get approved. Make sure your credit is good and your background is okay and you have enough money to pay the bills, but um, don't move anything in, but you're cool to, you know, buy and sell the way that you want to because you've talked to me and I like who you are and you've presented yourself well uh, and yes I give you my blessing as the park manager so around the country around about 50% of the time you will be allowed to invest in a senior park the other 50% of the time you won't however that doesn't mean to say that with the parks with that you can't invest in there's still not value to be created if there's a motivated seller you know Mary Lou is selling her property and she's and she she needs to move she wants to move she's frustrated and tired we can go ahead and help her whether it's keeping that home in the park whether it's moving it out whether it's selling to someone else or skipping over you and going to the next buyer there's a number of things to do or wholesale um, if the park doesn't want you there but it's obviously ideal if the park does want us there we can buy it we can sell it we can be kind of above board and let the manager know what we're doing so with all that said that was my long-winded answer of if you can buy in a senior park but you're not really a senior the next question comes from a reader or a watcher. Um, thank you so much for watching and reading. Uh, I masked his name uh, because he did email this to me um, and he did ask about a criminal record. Um, so many people, if you're, you know, you're, you're motivated, you're hardworking, you have this fire inside you, you know you can do it, you know you have the potential, there is that park manager. Whenever we're talking about a mobile home in a park um, that you have to go through and there's a criminal background check most of the time. They wanna know your credit, they wanna know your criminal history they want to know your background history and how much income that you make some parks are stricter the other and than others some parks are more uh, way way more lenient than others some parks don't even do a background check it's the few and far between but to give you an example like there's no one you know check across the whole country granted in your area there may be one company that owns 10 or 20 parks and then their cr uh, criteria may be the same throughout their entire communities or it may change here and there but when it comes to the criminal background as investors when the park knows that we're going to purchase the home clean it resell it to another person that park is usually less likely to be concerned with income but they're they are still concerned with um, with with your past evictions and with your criminal history so if depending on your criminal history that's a that's a concern like if it was just your income but you could show money in the bank that would be okay if you could show that maybe you just moved into the area you didn't have a job that would sort of be okay because they know you're going to resell the home uh, past eviction maybe here or there but definitely a criminal history or a sexual predator kind of thing the park is going to absolutely be looking at that and I know that you had mentioned 
mentioned in your email about recently within the past like two years having a drug charge and a stolen car charge so most parks there's always a park for somebody and I you know that that means that's you know some parks are yeah, there, there's always a park for somebody, and that's you know kind of a good thing and a bad thing. But parks kind of develop a develop a reputation, and yeah, that the stolen car within the past two years, over ten years, a lot of communities would overlook it. Even some communities would still like turn you away for that. Uh, but yeah, I will say the criminal record is an important one, and that might stop you from buying in certain communities. Now, can you still buy the home and pull the home out of there, or sell the home to someone that wants to move it, or sell it to someone else and skip over yourself and kind of do things under the radar of the manager? Yes, um, but to be above board, you know, that criminal history, because it is a stolen car, which is pretty serious, and then drugs, even within the past two years, managers are, a lot of managers are gonna look negatively on that. And it may be a deal breaker on some communities. But then again, continue forward, because in most areas there's dozens and dozens and hundreds of parks if you go far enough away. So there are gonna be some parks that when you can come across humble and sincere and ethical and above board, honesty is the best policy. When you're talking to a manager or an owner, don't even hesitate. Managers are so finely tuned to picking up your BS, to picking up dodging your questions, questions to picking up lies be very upfront and honest we're there to help the manager and if they turn us away I want it to be because they're in a bad mood or they already had this decision in their mind but nothing from you you know you're gonna be proactive honest sincere upfront humble I hope that that really made sense and answered the question about the you know the criminal background if you have any specific questions you know about your specific history you the person watching this video feel free to email me at support at mobilehomeinvesting.net the next question uh, comes from how to find a VIN, a vehicle identification number, or a serial number in a mobile home. And there's a couple different ways. The first one is with a mobile home data plate. Uh, this is usually made of a paper, sometimes it's metal, but it's gonna be somewhere inside of a mobile home. Uh, it's usually in where the pantry is, or where the hot water heater is, or in the master bedroom closet, or um, in the, near the electrical panel. And it's going to be a piece of paper, it might have been painted over, covered up, removed over the years, um, it's weird because like some people do just paint over this. They don't really know like, oh, I should keep this, you know, valuable piece of paper that's glued to the wall, but it doesn't really even say like, don't remove this under penalty of law. There's more protection for your mattress a uh, little tag than there is the mobile home data plate. But that's ideally where you wanna find the mobile home's information. Another way to find the mobile home's pertinent information, um, it's not always the VIN number, it's not always the serial number, but it is pertinent information for this specific mobile home. And in reality, not all makes and manufacturers go ahead and put the number on the frame itself. And the skirting is normally gonna be uh, on the front of the mobile home but if you look on the front of the mobile home the tongue would usually be here it's taken off and put underneath the mobile home but if you look right to the upper left corner you can see a number here 1153 uh, now that's not the VIN that's not necessarily the serial number but you could call up the state and go ahead and verify with them what that number is if there are any if there's any number showing on the file um, showing on the state records for that number for a mobile home is it the VIN is it the serial number in different states it'll be different numbers uh, or it may be some other information or it may not even help you uh, the state may say we have no information of that now in many states you can look for the mobile home title in some states uh, there's no mobile home title in some states you don't need a title if the mobile home is a certain age however if the mobile home title is available you sort of have to trust that okay this mobile home title goes with this home usually the dimensions on the mobile home are or on the title of the home or on the title so if it says a 14 foot by 70 foot home and you can tell well this is a double wide which is way bigger than 14 feet wide or no way it's 70 feet I just walked it off and it's 50 feet in length that title might not be for that particular home but the mobile homes title will have all the pertinent information of the mobile home you can also call up the state and depending on the homeowner's name depending on uh, the address you can find out some of the pertinent information about that mobile home you're going to have to ask the clerk when you talk over the phone explain the situation explain what you're trying to do and they may be able to help you again that's calling your state's mobile home housing uh, title
title transfer department. In certain states, it'll vary. Well, in many states, it'll vary from department to department. So um, with that said, if you have any questions about your specific state, uh, there are, there's a link in the description about um, kind of transferring title in your specific state. I hope that that really made sense. Uh, the next question is an email question and it's about mobile home permits. Uh, I don't talk a lot about mobile home permits in my videos and are they actually look differently with a mobile home in a park, on land, a single family home? Um, and this is from an email, I'm gonna mask the name of the person, but it's from Rhode Island. And it's interesting, Rhode Island is one of the few states that even a mobile home inside of a mobile home community where you're renting the land, looks at that mobile home as real property. There's a warranty deed. There's not a title in Rhode Island, there's a warranty deed for a mobile home. Now, even with that said, that mobile home is a dwelling. So whether it's a personal property in most other states or it's a, a real property, even if it's in a rental park, or it's its own, on, 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 on its own piece of land. The city, the local municipality, wants to make sure that you are building up to certain codes. So in most areas, especially of the city limits, absolutely you need to pull codes if you're doing something that warrants it. Now just like a regular single family home, not all investors or homeowners pull codes. Some people do it, they don't even know they have to pull codes. Hey, I wanna replace the windows or replace my, you know, over 500 square feet of my flooring. Most people, some people, don't even know to, I have to go talk to my city, pull a permit, put the permit on the door to let people know I'm gonna be working, do the work, have an inspector come to inspect that work, and then sign off on that permit. The permit pay costs a little bit of money, that includes the inspector coming out. If you don't do the work right, they'll come out again. And once it passes inspection, boom, you're good to go. And it's just a way for the government to, in the local municipality to make sure you're doing the work correctly up to local codes. And in the county limits, there's usually less regulations. Um, than in the city limits. In the city limits, there's gonna be more regulations typically, and there's more code enforcement officers driving around. That's what I meant when I said some people do it and some people don't. And to be honest with you, if you're doing work inside of your home, not many people are gonna know. Now, if you have a dumpster outside where you're hauling things away in, your, your neighbors might complain and you might get red tagged, which means stop, you know, it's the city saying stop what you're doing. Uh, so if your neighbors complain, if someone tells on you, or if you're doing roof work or some siding work, clearly anybody can see that, or you're building a big deck. Depends if the code enforcement officers come through the park and they're just kind of writing down thing, violations that they see and they see you doing work. Hey, this home never had permits pulled. So absolutely do mobile homes in parks fall under the same permits as uh, regular mobile homes or even single family homes in the area. I'm watching the uh, dump trucks go by. We're having a couple mobile homes moved into uh, the community where I'm at right now, where I'm sitting in this home. And that's a, uh... oh, two, jump, two dump trucks. Oh, you know what, let's go, let's go take a look at this. Why not, huh? Because you're gonna be wondering, say, John, what are you talking about? Let's go check this out. All right, so we got those two dump trucks coming in. Guys are working. All right, I love it. Love it. Our next question is a good one. Now, I'm not exactly sure um, exactly how this writer means how to help a know-it-all seller. Uh, I feel like I've dealt with a few know-it-all sellers in my day. Um, and our job is to help people. Our job is not to be a bully, not to be aggressive. We do want to be assertive. Sellers aren't dumb. And if they think they can sell their home for more money or they're patient or they, they you know, want to continue marketing, good for them. We should encourage that. Let the market speak. So you know, in order to help a know-it-all seller, I'm curious if they're know-it-all because they know what their home is worth and they're, you know, I'm 100% positive. I want $80,000, $50,000, $20,000 for my home. And if that's the case, 
you know, and how to help them is to kind of verbally pat them on the back. Good for them. They have the time. They have the wherewithal to wait. They they can obviously lower their price if you know if they get more motivated. Uh, so it's a question of you know, are they a know-it-all because of price, or are they a know-it-all because they uh, understand the process? They um, they work for some sort of closing attorney, or they have some relative that's you know with a, a police organization. And some people they feel you know more entitled or more condescending than than other types of sellers. And if that's the case, you know, maybe we can kind of work with those folks as best as we can to get the deal done. So if it's condescending, uh, but it it's stepping, you know, closer and closer to a deal, well then great, let's go ahead and do it, let's suck it up, and let's try to help folks and do what we need to do to get the deal closed. But if they're if they if they're a know-it-all on price and the deal's going to be skinny, well that's not even a question. You know, we're we're, we're going to work with people, even if they don't match our personality style, we're still going to work with them, deal with the know-it-all people, try to be helpful. Um, but then again, there's a many other fish in the sea. And that's something I've learned you know, a couple years into this business. If we have all of our eggs in one basket, you make an offer to five sellers, now your, your hands are like, you know, you're just crossing your fingers. I hope that these sellers take it. Well, should I make a higher offer? Should I go back? Should I renegotiate? Maybe they didn't like me. What are they thinking? Versus, your job is you, you can't control what other people will do, how rational or logical sellers will be. You can control who you're talking to, the offers you're making, who you're following up with, the advertising and marketing, how proactive and reactive you're being, a list of other things and tasks. But as far as what you can't control is what other people will do. So um, that was my very long-winded answer of how do you help a know-it-all seller? You either you give them options and you're you're you know try to push to close uh, or not. But you need to know your numbers and not be swayed or bullied. I really hope that that helped and made sense. If you have any follow-up questions or concerns or any new questions, please don't ever feel to uh, hesitate to reach out to me at support at mobilehomeinvesting.net. That's support at mobilehomeinvesting.net. I'll talk to you soon. Bye bye.